Welcome everybody to Clubhouse Live. I'm your AAC events director, Heidi McDowell. And tonight we've got Jimmy Chin and Conrad Anchor right here in the clubhouse. I hope you can find some inspiration for your future adventures tonight, all from the comfort and safety of your couches. Now it's time to introduce our guests. When preparing for tonight, I had a lot of trouble writing their intros because Conrad and Jimmy have two of the most prolific, prolific climbing careers I've ever seen, but I managed to whittle them down to some choice highlights. Among his titles, adventurer, alpinist, photographer, director, Jimmy Chin is foremost a storyteller. Known for his ability to capture extraordinary imagery while climbing and skiing in high-risk environments, Jimmy has evolved from expedition lensman to Oscar-winning filmmaker. He began his professional career in 1999, and his talents were quickly recognized by top expedition leaders and outdoor brands. In 2002, he secured a breakthrough assignment to be the cinematographer for a high profile National Geographic sponsored trek across Tibet's Changtang Plateau. In 2006, he became one of the only people to ski off the summit of Mount Everest. A longtime member of the North Face athlete team, he has led dozens of exploratory expeditions and completed first descents around the globe, working with the best adventure athletes in the world. With Jimmy tonight is Conrad Anker, who has been pushing the limits of mountaineering for the last 30 years, evolving into one of America's best alpinists. The Bozeman, Montana-based father of three is one of the most prolific explorers and mountaineers alive today. Conrad climbed Mount Rainier by the time he was 16. He then went on to climb Mount Everest three times and notched the long-awaited first ascent of the Maru Shark's Fin in India with partners Jimmy Chin and Renan Oster. Throughout his career, Conrad has pioneered difficult new routes in the most remote places on earth. And at home, Conrad's got a philanthropic side. He serves on the boards of Protect Our Winters, the American Himalayan Foundation, and the Alex Lowe Charitable Foundation. Ladies, gentlemen, all welcome our guests for tonight's Clubhouse Live, Conrad Anker and Jimmy Chin. Hi. <laughs> hey, Conrad. Oh, Jimmy, how are you? Oh. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Nice to be on here with you. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I always think you get like notes from um, family members when you do those sort of introductions, like, oh, they're the best. <laughs> Not those kids. But, anyways, yeah. Jimmy, missing uh, getting together with you. I mean, we're, uh, what, yeah. eight, nine weeks into this. Uh, time of uncertainty and we planned to get together and go skiing and go do some things and um so here we are we're <laughs> getting to see the other side of jimmy via uh, zoom calls and, and zoom conferences with that yeah. so <laughs> good stuff well, well thanks everyone for uh tuning in to uh the clubhouse live this is uh first time for jimmy and i to be part of this and we're um really Psyched to be part of the American Alpine Club. It's a great group, great organization, provides community to us and a bunch of other things that um, you can check in and follow up along those. So today we're going to um, kind of just delve right into uh, Antarctica. And before we go to Queen Maudland, I'm gonna um, just do a little bit of an overview of where Antarctica is. So let's um, see where we are with that. Let's share that and then yeah okay here we are so antarctica is uh the planet's fifth largest continent it is home to 90 percent of the world's glaciers and locked up in those uh that 90 percent of the world's glaciers is 70 percent of the world's fresh water and so it's um you can see in this wonderful google image here um there's several mountain ranges this is uh the sentinel range uh, vincent massif and the high point of antarctica is located just in here this is the Transantarctic mountain range. They are the largest mountain range in uh, Antarctica. There's also Queen Maud Mountains. And then Queen Maud Land is this section over here. And then this is the range in which we were climbing. This is uh, Cape Town, South Africa. So we uh, fly onto the continent um, from South Africa. And then if you go off to this side here, there's Tasmania and Australia on that side. So um, kind of an overview. South Pole is right about there in the center of this. Um, 
Argentina, Chile there. And so when you access Vincent, you usually fly in from Punta Arenas right into there on the Antarctic Peninsula. And you can see here in this wonderful map that has the uh, underwater topography there. This is, um, there was sort of a break in this land mass and, mass, and this is a South Georgia Island out there. And you can just see that break between the, um, the lower South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. And what's important about Antarctica is that what happens in, in Antarctica matters to the rest of this world, especially where we are now in uh, the age of climate change. So the, um, <clears throat> we can see here this thermographic map the increases from 1957 to 2006 of the temperatures in Antarctica. 1957 was the International Geophysical Year in which the International Antarctic Treaty was signed, where um, there is no one um, nation that owns Antarctica, and uh, it put limits on um, exploration, tourism, um, science, not limits, but it codified it. And so there's no uh, mineral extraction or petroleum extraction there. So <clears throat> it's really important. It's also now where um, the, the cold water that comes off Antarctica drops into the bottom of the oceans and that then cold water being heavier than the warm water drives all the, the uh, global currents around the world. So it's really important to that. So exploration, Antarctica was first visited probably in the 1870s um, by whalers. Um, they were down there seeking uh, the whales, the right whale, the blue whale, um, the sperm whale were primarily their, their, um, what they were looking for. And then beginning in uh, 1911, um, or prior to that, but 1911 with the uh, getting to the South Pole. And so this is uh, Robert Falcon Scott and his team that had um, made it there a month after Amundsen uh, from Norway had. And the men are looking pretty uh, and they're looking hammered, uh, one, because of the environment, but two, that they'd lost out on this race. And there wasn't the capability for them to upload via satellite and track the other team's um, travel as they do now, the, the current generation of Antarctic explorers. So it was a little bit um, different then. But this marked the transition from uh, exploration for material gain or for um, nation state or proselytizing or um, this sort of the the, the unfortunate history of what exploration on, and for humanity was about. And that became for an aspirational thing to be the first uh, nation to have a flag at the South Pole was meaningful. And so that was um, a big part of that. Prior to the 1911 uh, arrival at the South Pole, one gentleman tried in um, 1908 with Scott, and that was Sir Ernest Shackleton and referred to as the boss. And so if you're a fan of, uh, Antarctic history, um, look up uh, Amundsen, Shackleton, uh, Mawson, Douglas Mawson from Australia. All three of these, uh, these polar explorers had wonderful stories of running out of food. <laughs> but they also did lots of great ex exploration too. But um, you can imagine here, this is uh, Shackleton and his team. They set off uh, in 1914 on the onset of the second, or for the Great War, not the Second World War. They hadn't had it yet. but. Um, they were urged to go on, and this is uh, Shackleton here, looking pretty proud. And they had these nice little keepers for uh, keeper leashes for their mitts. Um, but the um, they never made it onto the continent. Their goal was to walk across the continent, um, traverse it, and be picked up uh, by a ship that had departed from Australia. They never set a uh, foot on the continent. The ice uh, prevented them from doing that. And then it took their uh, wooden ship, the Endurance, and crushed it like a cork. And not so good. So um, one of those things that you can look up into if you're interested in that. Uh, mountaineering in Antarctica pretty much started in 1967 with the um, ascent of the Vincent Massif and that was uh, led by Nick Clinch, one of our uh, former presidents of the American Alpine Club. And they landed on uh, the west side of um, the uh, Ellsworth Mountains and then Klein Vincent and Tyree and several several other mountains there. And this was um, kind of the what it looked like. This was the admin of it. And so this um, team, uh, this is state-of-the-art equipment, uh, frame packs and uh, big down outfits and then bunny boots. So if you've ever um, imagined winter boots that weigh twice as much as you normally would with strap-on crampon. So uh, a hardy bunch of explorers back there at the time. And then the summit of uh, Vincent here, which is the seventh um, 
the high point and one of the seven summits. So it's a, quite a, a draw for people to come in there and to, to visit that point. So from there, um, we're gonna transition over to uh, Queen Maud Land. And so to introduce this, um, this is a photograph um, that my friend Alex Lowe, late friend Alex Lowe took of John Krakauer and I in um, the uh, winter of 96, 97, or Austral summer, so 96. And off in the background there, that's uh, Ovatana, which is the wolf's tooth. And we're over here on Rakyaneven, which means the rock razor in Norwegian. So um, there, <laughs> we look like such, such goofballs in here, but <laughs> we got to like that. And then, so this back here, this is um, the Ovatana range. And this is where we set out to go on our, um, on our expedition in 2017. So bringing it back to, uh, to Jimmy there. Um, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's such a cool uh, perspective of Ovatana. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we, we thought we'd talk a little bit about our climb on Alvatana. Uh, this is 2017. And I don't know, actually, I was wondering, were you aware of Alvatana before your first Antarctica trip? Or had you seen it from Rockaniven and thought, like, that's the one I want to climb? Yeah, so um, Queen Maudland is um, claimed by Norway, even though it's not a, it's, sort of nation agnostic. No one owns any uh, of those regions in there. But they, um, um, uh, Ivar Tolson, who we met down on our expedition, had been there two years prior to us, and they did the first ascent of, uh, of Ovatana. So we knew that they were in there. And then this subrange, just maybe another 30 kilometers to the east, was uh, where Rakaneven was. And so we knew about that peak, but we had set our goals on, on Rakaneven, which was an unclimbed peak. And we were supported by the um, National Geographic Society. So that was our, our trip then. Hmm. Because uh, I'm just going to tell, tell a little anecdote about the beginning of our, our trip there. And I think you actually had some. Do you have images of us landing or something? Yeah, we got, um, yeah. Uh, you know, you fly to um, Cape Town, South Africa, which is where we launched from. And we were with uh, Sav, Cummins, uh, Anna Pfaff, Cedar Wright, Alex Honnold, and Pablo Durana um, flew in on this Aleutian and landed uh what's the i forgot the name of that spot novosibirsk yeah because i always i the novo camp i i just kept calling it hoth because that's what it kind of <laughs> feels like it it feels otherworldly this is my first trip to antarctica so um and we had you know a five day six day layover in cape town because of the weather couldn't get in couldn't get in and then finally landed there. When you land there, it just feels, it feels as otherworldly as any place I've ever been. But uh, we ended up there at Novo for four or five days as well because of uh, some storms. So we couldn't necessarily fly in to our base camp. And it was kind of a short expedition. So when you lose kind of 10 days of your expedition, just waiting can get a little, um, hectic because you're all wound up and really been preparing for this expedition for a long time and so when we landed there um can you show the next slide oh that's actually when we get to base camp yeah that there we one. go that's what you're looking for <laughs> this is at novo base uh base camp we you know you've got a crew of like highly motivated athletes and here's alex training we set up a little training center uh, people are doing push-ups sit-ups pull-ups um trying to stay fit but uh it was a awesome time for us to just hang out and get ready uh and then eventually we flew into to base camp um but on a twin otter so it's like an another two hour flight or something like that is that how long it took yeah all of, uh yeah. 40 minutes Oh, oh it's only 40 minutes. Okay. But it does, it feels extraordinarily remote. 
And the story I want to tell is that Conrad kept saying, oh yeah, I'm just going to hang out and be kind of base camp manager and cook and, <laughs> you know, make sure everybody's, you know, got hot water and fueled. Um, and Conrad landed first. It was two flights in. I got back on the plane so I could shoot photos because they're shuttling the second team in. And by the time I got back, I landed and, you know, I assume Conrad was building out camp and, you know, organizing gear. And I've probably been gone for a couple of hours. And Conrad comes back and he's like, Jimmy, I already found the line. We're climbing all the time. <laughs> And I was like, wait, 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 what happened to your whole plan? Um, <laughs> and the thing is, is when you fly into this range, uh, there's, there are mountains everywhere. They're like jaw dropping. There's walls everywhere. But there is definitely one mountain that sticks out um, and is, from my perspective, was <laughs> certainly the most intimidating looking uh, mountain there and that was all the Tana. Um, so it was just pretty funny because you know it was a classic Conrad move like oh I don't know I'm you know I'm just gonna keep it mellow and then he's there for like an hour and he's already skied up to the base of the climb looked at what the climb is gonna be has already figured out what we're gonna do um, and I hadn't even built my base camp tent yet so that's my little anecdote about how the trip started <clears throat> yeah well we were uh, <clears throat> shortened by time so we lost 10 days and what we'd hoped for was a 24-day trip ended up only being 14 so um yeah and then you have to fly out on on time when when you get that here's pablo so <clears throat> great guy one of the friendliest and hardest working people in the film business so if you've Want to see more of this? Real Rock has a, a film that's part of it that uh, Cedar um, and Taylor edited together. It's a great story of what we did on that climb, which was a lot of fun. Here's Alex in his tent. At first, he was like, ah, I don't do cold. This isn't really like, I don't know. <laughs> you know. That June, he'd soloed El Cap, so the world was at Alex's feet. So, But we're like, oh, this will be good. You're going to have a good time. You're going to do good things. And so, um, on left to right, uh, Anna there, and then Sav, Alex in the back, and Cedar. This is when the four of them climbed the Penguin, which was a uh, small um, by Antarctic standards, but large by most other standards. Um, first ascent that they did. It was really neat to, to see them on that journey and, and to be with them. And this was skiing over there. We call this kind of the, um, the Abbey Road uh, picture of, <laughs> of yeah. where we are. So. But that's all good. <laughs> oh man. But um yeah. What do you I'm supposed to like interview you, Jimmy, but I don't know what to interview. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we could maybe talk a little bit about how things got split up. So Alex and and Cedar paired up. Their goal was to climb basically all the other surrounding peaks of Alvatana and they it's called the wolf's jaw too because if you fly over it, it looks like a jaw it's got teeth on all the sides and then there's all the tana um so they wanted to climb light and fast and single push um same with anna and sav they were gonna go and try to do some first ascents as well and then conrad and i just got focused on um all the tana and i mean i would say that it's I don't know. I mean, one of the top, if not top climbs I've ever done. Um, just because it was so nice to be able to climb with Conrad. And, you know, we've been climbing together for, I don't know, 20 years now, I guess. And uh, you just get to know someone that well. And, um, and having spent so much time in that kind of an environment with Conrad, it just felt like 
the decision making, which is oftentimes like really challenging on expeditions, felt so easy. And there was just a lot of things that we didn't even have to talk about. And we were just in the in the flow of this climb, which I honestly, when we started it, I would I thought 14 days window, you know, with weather, I just looking at how big it was too, I was like, you know, I, I was like, oh, we'll just, we'll just try our hardest and see how far we get. Um, and it's pretty intimidating to walk up, even after this many expeditions to walk up to that wall um, and look up it. And, and it's kind of two tiers because there's the main big wall at the bottom. And then there's, you know, the upper ridge. Um, and that's about 4,000 feet of vert can you point to the bottom of the yeah river? so we camp was over here and we, we skied up across over and this was the start and what looked like great cracks they are great cracks but those things are chimneys so <laughs> you'd have to like go out here and find some little seam to go up that and our goal was not to climb with bolts and to do it as least intrusive as we possibly can so this was the uh, the journey of wideness, and of course, Cedar and Alex were like, "Well, we climbed everything. We did like 15 routes and whatnot, and 15 peaks, and every day they did a couple of them." But we were like, "Yeah, but they're kind of low angle, and <laughs> you know, the real stuffs, the steep climbing." They're like, "Oh, we're just saving that to the end. We're going to come and climb that anyways." But um, it was kind of neat because Jimmy and I were in our own little system of what we were doing and how we were climbing with it and starting up through this section in here. And so this was um, full Tourette and syndrome inducing off width climbing. So um, kind of came up here and came around the backside of that. And we set up a camp um, just sort of there on the backside and then climbed to the, almost the summit, that ridge there, and then had to descend up through this notch and up along through here and then set up a second camp there and then went up fixed ropes two pitches up to here and then went through there to the summit. So it was, um, yeah, it was nice. We got to spend some time camping on the, uh, on the mountain, which was really uh, the best part of it and moving up and down our fixed ropes. So this is why Jimmy's a uh, Oscar award winning photographer. <laughs> he has great looking pictures in there. And so this is one of Pablo's drone shots and kind of the, uh, sort of the landscape. So looking off towards- um, I actually think it's uh, one of Sav's shots. It's, oh, yeah. Up. Yeah, she That's came right. up and shot that. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Sav. I was, is yeah, there was, um, is totally a, a wealth of, of riches here to have two photographers, three photographers on the trip. So we're really fortunate on that. So this is my photography here. <laughs> <laughs> you the just yarding on, tape on my back from all the chimney. <laughs> yeah, we so it's dreaded our, our our gear. Yeah, this um this granite has been pushed up out of the ice, and it never had weathering with um, ice over it or anything like that. And the only weathering is uh, the wind and the frost, freeze frost. So it was incredibly sharp, and it just um. Clothing, there was short of climbing in a in sort of a, a suit of steel armor, which was unlikely you were going to tear anything up. And it was really difficult on our ropes. It just uh, played for keeps on in that end of things. But <laughs> yeah. So where is that? Oh, that's this the, is on this, that's the last pitch of the upper head wall. Yeah. And so you can see these wonderful huecos that were in there. And um, this section had been climbed previously. And so we, um, you know, it was neat to, to climb it without placing any pitons or any bolts um, on it and just sort of kind of moving up and being, um, figuring the gear we needed, um, the cams that we needed um, to get up there. But it was, um, the, the temperature was really what <laughs> set it aside from, doing about anything else because I think we each had uh, probably four layers of long underwear on our on our legs and then similar amount on our top and then fleece and then 
big puffy jackets included in all that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've never worn that many jackets because on top of the four kind of long underwear layers, we had a puffy jacket, a down jacket, another big down jacket. And then if you were belaying, we had another down, like a huge belay down jacket. So that was like, when you're wearing four giant puffy layers, um, it says a lot about how cold it was. And, and the difference between climbing in the sun and in the shade was, was significant. Um, we call it the ice box. And we were also, for a lot of the route, we were inside of these chimneys. So, you know, the sun would be like way up right out over there and we'd be in these little chimneys belaying for a few hours. Um, but I don't think I've ever, and I hope never to wear that many layers. <laughs> um, and it was funny because when we were in our down jackets, uh, they were so shredded that when we got on, into our tents, if you moved around, oh yeah, there's the ice box belay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, this is wearing face masks before face masks were mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember oh. that 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 pitch was like I I dropped a lot of I maxed out my f bomb vocabulary <laughs> on that pitch. Um, but yeah, we would get into our tents and move around, and it would be like being inside a a little um, one of those little uh, snowballs or whatever. It would it felt like it was snowing in there. They'd be down flying around everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's I, I love this perspective because you can see the ridge um, going up and right. And then the wall, I don't know, what do you think? How is that 2,000 feet, the first wall? Yeah, probably somewhere around there. Um, A little over 2,000 feet. And then you, we, yep. we traverse the ridge. You can see the tent down below, which was probably the coolest tent spot yeah, I'm just gonna claim it. I think that's the coolest tent spot I've I've ever had. Yeah, I haven't been to another one as cool because usually you're on a big wall and you're like, oh, I got the port ledge and it weighs a ton and it clanks around and you're kind of you can't do anything. I mean, you're in the sea of gravity. And here it was. I mean, we could. I mean, we had a little spot. We didn't want to go sleepwalking or anything, but it was. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then Not that you yeah, keep watching yeah you. this is this is the upper head wall which is like another 1500 feet or so um and so we spent a night after spending a bunch of days on the wall climbing putting up ropes and then this is this is getting this is the day we got to that that high camp that was a big push i remember yeah, and we had how we many were... ropes did we really we had four ropes with us no. Ooh. Oh, we only had I think two. For the, yeah, for the summer we had two. And so this one here, check that out. There's a rope goby. Yeah. This is a static rope that we were using. And then we also had a, one dynamic rope. And so our athletic tape right. was patching up rope gobies. And it was just. That's right. We, we went two ropes. Yeah, two ropes to the summit. And so it was, we were, um, we definitely felt kind of exposed because I mean yeah we did have the best rescue team down at camp but when it's uh, 30 below it doesn't really help you out if they're still miles away <laughs> yeah and so this is us getting into that camp um, and then the next day we fixed our two ropes right up the steepest yep. part of the the upper head wall then came back down spent the night um, and then the next day, we just, we planned to Jumar up our two fixed lines to our high point and then blast it off from there to the top, which was still, it was a pretty big, big day. I think it was a 20 hour round trip day or something like that. Yeah. I mean, if we'd been in... Like latitudes closer to the equator, it would have gotten dark on us, and so luckily it didn't get dark. Yeah. But twenty-four was, hours of light. So, but yeah, 
and then it got windy and when we were in places where the sun wasn't shining we were definitely we could feel the uh the temperature come in and it was really cold but this is um the top of that first pitch a little bit foreshortened and from where this picture jimmy took of me looking up that was that picture that we'd looked at a little bit earlier where it was all sort of funny stuff yeah well let me i'm going to stop that and we're going to go back to our chatting together <laughs> yeah so well, i mean i felt like it was probably it just felt really far out there but um i remember this moment though because conrad looked at me and said you know jimmy it's good we've been really conservative on this climb and i had just been bouncing back and forth a lot between jackson and new york city and getting my kids into school at you know the preschool on the upper east side and i just was laughing because you have to line up outside of these preschools and i was thinking about how um none of those people who were who were in that line probably would think anything in, around this was being conservative i just thought it was funny that conrad was like, oh it's good we've been so conservative on this climb i was like yeah. <laughs> feels really conservative um but yeah there's that last pitch to the top i don't even know if placed any gear on that pitch because it was just so crumbly yeah there was no gear on it it was um <clears throat> it wasn't steep but it was um it was like these bread loaves that went the wrong direction and you could maybe get like a big jumbo cam or something underneath them but it just it was just played off so it was scary because yeah. you're soloing it and it's not like it was solid granite so you know the, like the holds would seem really big but some of them would just peel off so it was a, it was a little nerve-wracking it was probably like oh it was negative 40 degrees don't you think yeah that summit it was incredibly cold and yeah it was neat this um jimmy made it up there i snapped this picture of him and he brought me up thanks jimmy <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> cold <laughs> You can see how puffy I am. <laughs> That's like one of my all time favorite selfies. <laughs> oh, off onto the summit, which was a which was a good time. Yeah, I appreciate that that journey, Jimmy. It was uh, pretty meaningful we, to be there and to with our group of friends and something like that. I mean, it's always what we live for those 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 rare moments that everything comes together and you have a good time. Yeah. And it just seems so unlikely. I was, I was kind of, I was pretty not surprised, but it, it's like you just put your head down and you chip away and you chip away, and sometimes you get to the top and sometimes you don't. But um, it seemed like a very unlikely summit, and 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 oddly, like I didn't have huge aspirations going down there, so when when you or, or when you said okay well, we're going for all the time i looked up there and i was like yeah i don't know man <laughs> um i mean i think if we had more time i would have been more optimistic but i was like I, I, it's just hard to tell the scale of the place and um you know when you're climbing in temperatures like that like technical climbing and steep climbing and the, that ridge traverse that Conrad's coming across there. I mean, it was a pretty convoluted traverse. So, you know, on traverses like that, it can feel really exposed because you basically have to climb it both ways, even when you reverse it. So once we cross that ridge, um, it felt like, you know, we we're pretty far out there. So uh, it's one of my, favorite images. The other yeah. nice thing about this, this climb, um, you know, outside of like the lower pitches where Sav and pa Pablo came up to shoot a bit on the fixed lines, but this is kind of like my favorite type of shooting on expeditions where, you know, that's, you're just kind of shooting on the fly. And um, I remember 
getting across this pitch and we still had to build camp and chop out a ledge. And I remember looking back at this and just being like, it just felt totally otherworldly. Um, you just don't get that kind of light and that kind of a background very often. So, you know, when I'm click, clicking photos, there are moments when you're, you're not even quite believing what you're seeing through the frame. You're just like, oh my God, look at this. It's insane. And we had a lot of those moments on this trip um, where we just sit down at the belay and, you know, you didn't have to say much. You just turn around and be like, whoa, this is, after having been to a lot of different places, um, still being speechless uh, from this view was, was pretty special. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> definitely fortunate to be able to go to uh, Antarctica. And it, I mean, it comes with uh, being what we, who we are and what we do, but there's also the responsibility is we have as citizens of this planet to take care of it and to have insight into what Antarctica is and a perspective that um, buttresses what the scientists are studying down there, but the immeasurable beauty of it. In the background here, some of the peaks that Cedar and Alex climbed, all of them, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. Doom, doom, doom. <laughs> yeah, so. that was the last one, this close one. That yeah. skyline, didn't they climb that skyline yeah. on the left? No, the, the, the next one back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that was the That's first right. event, that route. Yeah, and it was somewhere up in there that Alex got really cold and really scared, which is yeah. rare for <laughs> the man of steel. <laughs> yeah. So, epic trip all around. Oh, I'm sorry, it went black there. But let's. Um, See if we have any questions from our yeah. viewers and Heidi. Let's see what we got. Anyone in there with some ideas? Well, hello. And of course, we have questions for you guys. Uh, the comment field on the Facebook page has been blowing it up. So if anybody else has a question for Jimmy and or Conrad, throw it in the comment right there. Uh, and if we have time, we will get to it. But let's kick things off. We've got a comment uh, or a question from Wei Ming. Do you have a favorite failure that later set the stage for a different success? Well, Jimmy, I'll let you start okay. with that one. <laughs> oh, I, I have to think about that for a second. Um, I should have started with a softball. I'm sorry, guys. I just went right no, in. That's a good one. <laughs> Well, um, we'll just use this as kind of a screensaver till we get there. This is uh, Cedar and Alex skiing up along there. But um, yeah, every time you go in the mountains, there's um, it's an unknown process. And you go there because you know very well you could fail. Um, so that's kind of why we like it and that teamwork that builds into it. So the, um, I mean, after uh, Meru with uh, Renan and um, Jimmy and I on that on that expedition were we pretty much we we pushed the limits of running out of food and living in a portal ledge and so we had that down pretty good so the the learning lesson on this was the how cold it was and it's one thing if you're going up a, a moderate um, slope or something but when you have to play skier and you're fiddling with climbing hardware and it's all pretty tiny relative to the temperature, it really adds to the, the process of it. Yeah. I would say that almost every failure is, is a learning lesson to um, help you anticipate um, future potential problems. And, you know, I think it's, it's not uncommon to go for a big objective um, and requiring multiple attempts because it's almost like you have to pay your dues. You have to like streamline getting to the mountain. Sometimes you don't even get to the mountain or um, you get part way up the mountain, you realize you're kind of outgunned or you need to be stronger. You didn't have the right gear and you learn all these little things. So like on Meru, that was a perfect example where 
you know, we learned a ton from the first failure and that really helped inform our decision-making from food and gear um, to approach, to how to think about the mountain, how to kind of anticipate the challenges of the mountain. Um, but the thing about those failures is, and, and really hard moments is that that's kind of what you can use for your comparison. So, you know, while we were on Alvatana, it was freezing, you know, but we'd both been in that kind of cold in the Himalayas. Um, and, you know, you could think, oh, well, at least it's not snowing, you know, or at least the, there's no wind. So it's really not that bad. So why don't we can keep going? And those kind of previous experiences where, where things are really, really bad, you kind of have them as a reference. You're like, well, I survived that. And it ended up being really, really hard. But, you know, in retrospect, maybe it wasn't that bad, but you, you kind of use that mind game of, comparing your current situation to like the worst thing you've experienced and you're like oh okay this isn't so bad we should keep going um, and at least it didn't get dark <laughs> yeah so but that sometimes was the joke time. is it's like it's negative 40 degrees out and it's super windy but at least it's snowing <laughs> you know you kind of get into yeah. dark humor up there <clears throat> Well, they say knowledge comes from experiences and experiences come from making bad decisions. So yeah. <laughs> you just have to stay ahead of the curve. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of something that outdoor adventures uh, all have had bad experiences with, we have a question from the audience uh, from Phil wondering what your most memorable meal from a big climb is. No, he says most memorable, not necessarily best. <laughs> Oh, I always eat the same thing. So they're all, it's like one bland memory. <laughs> uh, I mean, I feel like, Conrad, you've really improved on your expedition um, diet, though. Like this last trip to Antarctica this winter in January, um, Conrad was cooking it up big time in base camp. Um, I mean, like really, really cooking it up. I was super impressed, but once we usually embark on the wall or on, I mean, I would say probably the hardest eating wise expedition I've ever done wasn't actually on Meru, it was on um, our expedition on the Changtang Plateau uh, where we had to, you know, we're crossing the Changtang Plateau on foot and our food supply, um, you don't think of them as meals so much as you just think about it as fuel. So it would just be a mashup of whatever calories, like taste was totally irrelevant. It was just about for like half frozen olive oil squeezed into freeze dried um, beans. And that would be it. And it's just fuel. Like it's just your job to like make sure you have enough calories so you can stay warm enough to sleep and then get up in the morning and move. So there were a lot of meals of um, really bad freeze dried stuff with olive oil because it's high calorie content. Um, so <laughs> maybe I've tried to forget some of the meals. <laughs> Base camp, you can have, you're like on a family cookout barbecue, so you can like up your game with it. But when you're on the climb, you're there to climb, you're not there to have a picnic, so. Um, <laughs> not just, putting out the checkered tablecloth. Yeah. So I'm always sneaking like little things in my pack, like chocolate and gummy bears, and mints, <laughs> and um, kind of my, my comfort survival food, but. Yeah, when it comes to like mealtime with Conrad, it's just business. It's like on the wall or on the mountain. It's just like, use your ration. Don't waste it. <laughs> Eat it slowly. Yeah. So this next question comes from longtime AAC volunteer, Emily Cumberland. And she's wondering, Jimmy and Conrad, if you guys have a favorite memento from the Oventana trip. Hmm. Uh, Jimmy just turns around and surveys his gear room. 
I do. I've got a few. I, I can show, I can bring one over actually. Yay, um, show and tell. <laughs> oh, I've got a couple things. I've got, I've got the ax that Conrad and I use. It's pretty battered. But that rope Conrad is showing on that photo, here's all the taped up gobies from that climb. I think we actually cut it. Yeah, then, I've got the other half. Oh, which do you? Pamela has as a rope carpet. So. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, and then uh, this is pretty funny. This is a helmet I wore, um, and we all did some art on it. Conrad drew this mountain, and I had everybody sign it on the expedition. Um, Conrad and oh Cedar, Yolo hashtag Yolo. You only live once. And this one's pretty funny. This one's from Alex Honnold. It says, safety first. <laughs> so that's my momentum. It, it's kind of beat up. Yeah. Show and tell. Love it. Um, so we have uh, lots of questions. So hard to choose here. Um, this one comes from Ben W. He is wondering for a push like that, what size haul bag and hauling setup are you usually using? Hmm. We had a grade seven. So that's like the big jumbo size. I don't know how many liters that is, but it's big. And then, um, yeah, standard yeah. LCAP hauling setup. Yeah, then we, we basically hauled the grade seven up to the top of the wall. It had all our alpine climbing stuff. And then when we got to the top of the wall, we ditched all that stuff and then just took two ropes and then our alpine packs. I think they were like 60 liter, you know, North Face Profit packs. Um, and just set out, uh, we each had like a negative 20 degree bag uh small two plus person alpine tent and then um and a pretty good sized rack ice axes i think we had two sets of tools right yeah, yeah. but we never encountered any water ice or any no. that type of ice it was, it was the, the big thing was the s h o v e l <laughs> we called it the number seven because we were using the shovel to basically clean out the cracks and so most of the time out of the time we were cleaning out cracks with the shovel and we literally just had the shovel clipped off on our harness like a cam so it'd be like oh we're pulling out the number seven and um, trying to find gear you could place and yeah, that was a pretty That's important. some intel and wisdom straight from Jimmy and I. And we, on our second go on uh, Meru, we took a shovel with us on lead and it made a huge difference. So you, you can clear out loose snow is when you don't, when you have snow that doesn't get a sun uh, effect, it doesn't consolidate, it's usually rotten and miserable. <laughs> but then you can claw out the snow, you can get into the bottom of the crack. So um, yeah, it's uh, a lot faster. <laughs> Yeah. So maybe it's like this subset of climbing. You're like, oh, I'm an off with climber. Like I climb with a shovel on lead. <laughs> yeah. It's a particular type of groveling. And we did joke on this whole expedition that like we were we, we were doing like the manual like groveling climbing. And then Alex and Cedar were doing like the speed, lightweight thing, but we were doing blue collar climbing. <laughs> there you have it, folks. Always bring your number seven. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this question actually came to us from a couple of different people. So popular topic, uh, both Rachel and Jacob asked uh, what your thoughts are on how we can balance a love of travel and climbing while staying sensitive to our carbon impact, crag overcrowding, and staying good stewards of our environment, which I know is a super important topic for both of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Conrad, you want to talk about, 
I mean, the North yeah. Face. Go ahead. I think you're more articulate about it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So on this expedition, we um, we purchased uh, carbon offsets. So all of the North Face expeditions and all corporate travel, we as a brand believe in that. And it's not the solution to it, but it is a way of uh, a voluntary tax to uh, to bring into uh, what is going on there. When climbing in Antarctica, we had to have permission from the United States Environmental Protection Agency because we were citizens of the United States and we were following the rules of the United States. So if we were Tajiki climbers, we'd be following Tajiki environmental rules when we climbed in Antarctica. So that was what we had to do. And that was, um, a fair amount of uh, um, permission asking and paperwork that went with it and along those lines. And so, yeah, Antarctica is unique and we're fortunate to be able to go there and, and to work in the capacity that we do, storytellers and to share these experiences with people, very thankful for that. Speaking locally, um, there's, uh, I'm happy to see people out climbing. It's that people are out climbing, whether it's at the gym or, at, at, at the local crag that um, it's a great way for humans to interact with other humans and that we it's not overtly competitive it's not being better than the other team or something like that the challenge is gravity and the weather and things like that and it's really supportive along those lines and because of that that understanding of how we have to accept nature is you know, on the terms that nature sets is makes us better and more understanding of what's going on with it. And so within that, we're, um, I mean, obviously we all have impact just by our very existence, but we want to live, we want to live a, a full and engaged life and do wild things if you're a climber like that. So finding that balance within it and, um, you know, respect to the Alpine Club for, um, leading in, in ways that how we can access crags and how we what our impact is and what climate change is. So the next question comes from Ye Jin wondering what advice would you guys give to an 18 year old aspiring mountaineer and which discipline rock ice skiing etc do you consider the most important for a young climber to develop? Hmm. And you can't say all of them. <laughs> all of them. No, um, <laughs> no Jimmy, no. <laughs> I, uh, I think one thing about climbing that I do notice, and, and I and I've, you know, fell into this trap as well. It's like, because um, you, you have to be goal oriented and, and have objectives um, to push yourself. But it's also just recognizing that every step of the process is is important and there's, the point isn't to try to get ahead faster. Um, it's it's about embracing the moment, embracing each step, enjoying the journey, um, because that's just that's what it continues to be. It just continues to be this journey, um, and I think we have to remind ourselves that sometimes too, because we get very objective, you know, um, goal oriented, and and we forget to kind of enjoy you know each part of it even though most of the time you're suffering a lot but um <laughs> but uh yeah there's no rush you know it's like each step is so important each step is enjoyable each step is part of that process of being a climber so kind of um enjoy it for what it is and and um and before you know it you know you'll be doing things that you never thought you'd be able to do. Uh, and, and I think Connor and I still probably go through that process um, daily or in, in, in our climbing careers. So, um, but in terms of like a particular uh, aspect of climbing, I mean, everybody's drawn to different things. And in my career, I've always, I've gotten really focused on one thing for a while. And then, um, and then I've kind of either gotten burned out or distracted and I'm like oh I want to go do this and because I've always wanted to kind of keep it fresh uh, but that's not the way everybody's done it like I mean there's so much specialization um, from now not just bouldering and sport climbing and alpine climbing and track climbing but now it's like there's even you know bouldering in a gym and that type of 
you know, there's, there's so much specialization and people are just drawn to it. So if you're drawn to something, um, you should do it. Uh, and, you know, um, sometimes that's really good because you can get really focused and, and get really good in, in a particular aspect, but they're all part of climbing. And as Conrad said, it's all about, you know, it's all about wrestling with gravity. <laughs> Conrad, do you have anything to add for our aspiring climbers out there? Um, know your systems. Gravity plays for keeps. Yeah. That's good. Good point. It applies to skiing, to ski mountaineering, and to ice climbing, climbing, free climbing, rock climbing. It's all there. Know your systems. So this uh, next question comes from Mary F. She was wondering, uh, Jimmy, she's wondering about your experiences in the outdoor sport and adventure world as a person of color. Uh, she's wondering if there have been any unexpected challenges or experiences, uh, either positive or negative uh, throughout mm. your journey. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why I felt very at home when I first started you know, really spending time in Yosemite and climbing. Um, and, you know, this is 20 plus years ago, but uh, when climbing wasn't as mainstream, but I just felt like, it was like everybody was kind of a misfit and everybody kind of accepted each other for who they were. Um, so my experience, you know, being Asian American has been, you know, very positive. Um, I can't really even think of a moment from being in this community where I felt discriminated against or um, I've always felt really embraced. And that's probably why, you know, I love this community and I'm, I'm still a part of it. Um, but I know that that might not be the case for everybody, uh, but personally it's been a very, you know, the challenges that I found in it have not been based on race, but yeah. That makes me really happy to hear it. The community is the main thing that I love about climbing too. Um, so Conrad, this next question comes from Alejandro and Brian, wondering if since you and Jimmy have been such long-term climbing partners, uh, 20 plus years, as you mentioned earlier, do you guys have a special ritual when you summit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we have a big hug and the, um, this, uh, for Ovatana, it was a special moment. Um, there I'd, I'd uh, you know, my first trip to Queen Maud Land was with uh, the late Alex Lowe. So I had a moment of remembrance for him. And then, um, just prior to this, um, Jimmy's father, Frank, had passed away. And so this was um, something as a way to the two of, I mean, we, we honored people that weren't with us. And it's a, it's a moment there. I mean, you, our main concern is getting down safely and warmly, but that was, um, but mostly I think on any summit that you have, it's always um, giving thanks for the people that have, brought you to where you are at this point that, that have encouraged you, supported you. So uh, in my case, my family, um, starting with my parents, my spouse, Jenny, and our boys, um, and, and the climbing community to get there. So that's, um, but yeah, no, I don't like bring up a pair of dice or <laughs> a, a rodeo rope, or no. I had a friend that brought up a horseshoe one time. I'm like, that thing weighs a bunch. We could have had a lot of candy bars. <laughs> so it's yeah. just, it's the emotion yeah i think i i over the years for sure saw conrad bringing photos of the family and you know um but i think that that's a common maybe i got it from conrad or maybe not but you know when we it's it's always a moment of being grateful um to be able to live the lives we live and of course to think of all the people um, that we are surrounded by that have helped us along the way. Um, and then it's about, there's this moment though when it clicks and it's like, okay, now it's time to go down. And 
and you know um, it's business because a lot of things can happen when you're going down. Um, so you kind of click out of that and you go into business mode of don't make any mistakes. Um, we need to get off the mountain, so. Here's my little show and tell. So this is a little card that um, it's, <laughs> it's a photograph with packing tape and there's a little picture of Jenny cut out in the heart there. And on the back I have written kindness, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, acceptance, honesty, optimism, humor, perspective, wisdom, faith, courage, and commitment. So this little card, Jimmy's seen it around. <laughs> I, I look forward to the day where I get to pack it up and I get to take it on the next expedition. So it, um, it stays at base camp. I'll, I'll have a different one. I mean, now I have my phone so I can bring up just there's the picture of the family. <laughs> That's such a cute memento to have with you, though. I love that. All right. So uh, we have lots of questions from the audience, but uh, can't keep Conrad and Jimmy all night. So I'm sorry if you are out there and watching and we're not getting to your question, but we're going to wrap up with one last question. Uh, so you both are big supporters of the AAC in various ways. Jimmy, you regularly donate photos for AAC fundraisers. You've both donated your time to present at many an AAC event, including tonight. Thank you again for being here. Uh, Conrad, you've gone to Washington, D.C. with our Climb the Hill team to advocate for climbers and our wild places. Um, what does the AAC mean to each of you? Why are you so supportive in, in, in giving of yourselves to this organization? Well, I can start. Um, I, uh, I've, I've, I think the first three expeditions I ever put together were um, American Alpine Club grant recipient um, expeditions. So including my first one, which was a very pivotal expedition for me. Um, and I got, uh, I think I've gotten two or three Lyman Spitzer grants. And those were really critical for me at that point in my career at the very beginning. Um, and it made a huge difference. And, and it, it also, it made a huge difference in terms of like, just the confidence I had to like put the trip together and move forward with it because you know it was being recognized by the American Alpine Club and and the history and that community um, of the American Alpine Club and being a part of that just made you know gave me a little bit more confidence um, and a sense of belonging and and I feel like it was so impactful for me to have that. Um, and then over the years to see, you know, the work that the American Alpine Club does. Um, also Phil Powers uh, was someone really key in my career very early on. He was the person that I went to and was like, how do I put this expedition together? And, um, and then he later became obviously the president of the, the club and um, he's someone that I looked up to and still look up to. Uh, and it's just that community um, is really special. And I think that it plays a really important role um, in kind of having the space, um, holding that space for, for all of us who like to wrestle with gravity. So um, I'm a huge supporter. I think it plays an important role. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. And um, yeah, it was uh, that sort of the in climbing, you have to literally have someone show you the ropes. So there's a real mentorship and understanding with it. And so that um, in meeting with climbers that were able to help us out and guide you on expeditions, um, the library has been an incredible asset over the years. I um, always enjoy going in there and going through the racks of books and dreaming and seeing places. The American Alpine Journal is the annual um, journal of note, um, globally speaking, for climbs around the world. And so if you're looking to go to a range, you can always research the Alpine Journal. It's available online with that. Many of the uh, huts from the Gunks to the Tetons um, are a key part of that. And it's also giving a voice for climbers. And 
as Jimmy mentioned, we're kind of misfits. Um, <laughs> It, 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 we all came together, but um, we're there, we're speaking out on access for the areas that we uh, care deeply about. And also we're the voice for these wild places, the plants and animals and glaciers that have no voice, that um, we're representing them to elected officials. So it, um, at the end of the day, it's a warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> we should make that to a t-shirt <laughs> get a warm and fuzzy feeling <laughs> well i can't tell you how appreciative uh we all are at the aac for the support that you both have shown over the years um, and if you watching out there in the internet world uh, have enjoyed the session and it's within your means, consider making a small donation to support your American Alpine Club. Uh, we've made it easy. Just get out your phone and text the word uniting. That's U-N-I-T-I-N-G to 44321. Uh, Every dollar raised supports our efforts, protecting wild places, educating climbers, preserving climbing history for all to enjoy, uh, our funding our grants program like Jimmy was talking about, and of course, community events like Clubhouse Live. Uh, so again, if it's within your means, every dollar matters, just text UNITING. I'm gonna spell it out again, just like Conrad spelled shovel. That is U-N-I-T-I-N-G to 44321 to give today. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us in the AAC Clubhouse. These are weekly events, so be sure to tune back in next Thursday, May 28th, when Andrew Bisharat and Ashley Shires host the Clubhouse. Andrew Bisharat is a freelance writer, publisher of the climbing website Evening Sends, and co-host of the Run Out podcast. And Ashley Shires is a writer and registered psychotherapist who helps her clients navigate their journey through grief, something us climbers are all too familiar with, uh, using research-based mindfulness practices, including writing and meditation. So they'll be here next Thursday with some exciting updates from the AAC's Climbing Grief Fund program. So tune in. Uh, more info is on our website or Facebook or Instagram, all the places. Check it out. Conrad, Jimmy, thank you so much for being here with us in the AAC Clubhouse. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you, Heidi. Good yeah. to see everybody. <laughs> Let's go climbing soon. Yeah. <laughs> Ready. Yeah. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank see ya.